Colorado, and this is the data that we're keeping behind it. In this case, it's different from uh, other kinds of database systems, and they're very static, and uh, you, know, you have to figure out beforehand what you're going to do. Let's Could you show us uh, how, to, how to do a Boolean expression, for example, using Colorado? Okay, I'll just um, close this file here. I'll go over to what we call Tinker Menu. Again, we don't want to scare people with phrases like Boolean uh, expressions. <laughs> and uh, instead, you just highlight some, which means that you're going to highlight some of these states based upon the data that's underneath them. Mm -hmm. In this case, I'm going to look at those states that have greater than or equal to 50 computer stores in them. And I say done. Now, this idea is similar from when you go into people's offices. You see that they have maps on the walls with pins in them different colors. And well, file vision obsoletes mm -hmm. that. We've now redrawn the map based upon the data that's underneath it, and I can shade them a slightly different shade. I'm going to shade them a shade. Okay, okay, the map is now highlighting <clears throat> which states, Bob? The states that have uh, at least 50 computer stores or more. And then if I cancel the highlighting here, you'll see that we've redrawn the map such that you can quickly view the, the United States map and see which have uh, more than 50 computer stores. I you have some sorts of provi you have provisions in here then that you can build these, uh, build new pictures and store away pictures and categorize them and so forth. Yes, so you can build just mm -hmm. literally hundreds and hundreds of pictures. Not only that, uh, people are out developing file vision files that independent people can buy where they're already, the stuff is already mm -hmm. drawn for you. Right. Well, Bob, that's a very impressive use of the kinds of graphics mm -hmm. and power you were talking about, Gary. In just a moment, we're going to take a look at the Macintosh push into the business and office world, and we're going to, going to meet a man who used pull-down menus before anybody ever heard of a Macintosh. So stay with us. With us now is Lee Lorenzen. Lee was with Xerox when the star system was developed there, and Lee is now a software engineer with Digital Research Incorporated. And next to Lee is Bennett Wiseman. Ben is the Associate Director of the Market Analysis Service at Infocorp. Ben, it seems like the Macintosh was introduced, I guess, as a computer for the home, and then uh, uh, and, and now we're trying to break into the office with the Macintosh. What, what opposition is there going to be? Well, the uh, system has been built to be very easy to use, and very easy to install, and there are some limitations that have been put on that to get those compromises. And the question is really whether the ease of use will get them into the office or whether the limitations will prevent... Uh, what kind of limitations? We're talking limitations. Things already. like speed of the network, uh, mm -hmm. interfaces to other products. Uh, all of these things have been discussed, and Apple's very aware that they need them, but uh, the market still has to deliver on them. And mm -hmm. I think for business users, particularly larger business users, to be comfortable with what's going on, they'll have to see a lot more hard product and be convinced that Apple's going to give them the kind of support and uh, connection capability that uh, they're going to demand. Now, that may not be the case for smaller businesses where the attractiveness of the package and uh, things like the laser writer will make it very useful immediately for them, and they won't have concerns about how does this link to my IBM right. mainframe. Mm -hmm. Ben, in, in your report to your clients on this, you, you made an interesting comment that for Apple to succeed here with the Mac office, they have to kind of tone down their hype. What did you mean by that? Well, business users as opposed to home users tend to be extremely conservative, and a lot of the things that are attractive about Macintosh uh, work against the basic policies of a lot of office systems. They don't like openness and lack of control and uh, the ease of proliferation <laughs> of software and products, which is really the fundamental uh, theology behind a product like Macintosh and the Macintosh office. And if the advertising goes in such a way that uh, makes business users feel uncomfortable, uh, as opposed to IBM, who does everything possible to make them feel as supported and as loved as possible. Right, they don't no. run into difficulty. We, uh, advertising we're obviously that. trying to uh, break into another direction with Jim, which is a product that Lee's going to talk about, is from the IBM PC side into uh, taking that kind of a same, same interface and using that. Uh, Lee, can you talk about uh, Jim? Ball? Sure. I think the best way to talk about it is to actually get a demonstration of the product. As you can see, we're running here on an IBM PC AT. And I'll just pull up a calculator, which is an example of one of the desk accessories that we have. And as you can see, the color is really very vivid with Jim here. I'll go ahead and close that window out, and then we'll go into, this is the Jim desktop, which actually provides a visual look at the filing system, the underlying filing system of DOS, which is, it essentially replaces the A greater than, which is a difficult concept for users to, to uh, use. And let me bring up one of the pictures that we have here with Jim Draw. We'll click on that. and. Jim Draw is a, is a graphical drawing package which can be used for drawing things like you're going to see here in a minute, such as a video camera, or also for doing business presentations, uh, the kinds of foils with text that is the predominant part. 
As you can see here, we have a camera. We can come up here to the edit menu and duplicate that. Important thing here is that now we got two cameras, and we just have to move to this second one and, and drop it down like that. And it's as easy as that to use. The other important concept here is we can take that camera, and it's actually not just a single element as it appears on the screen, but many elements. And we can ungroup those elements. We see all the, the various pieces that make so up the camera. So this is a difference between a paint and a draw program, basically, is a, a paint program is just like a piece of paper. Once you've painted over or drawn over something, it's gone. And here the individual components and pieces are still available for, for moving or regrouping. That's yeah. right. And we've actually selected one of those objects here, and then we can come over here and give it a color, like so. So we got a red okay, body. So you draw it in black and white, and then you can add the color. Or you could you could have drawn it in color as you're going along, but you can add the color at really any point in the process. Okay, Lee, it, it looks like a kind of color version of a Mac type uh, interface. You're running this now on a PC AT. Is that the kind of machine you need to run, Jim? Well. Jim will run on machines like the PC. It even runs on the PC Junior. Um, it requires 256K of memory and um, obviously some kind of graphic screen to run. However, when you actually get into versions that support the color, it does take a machine more of the horsepower of an, of an AT or a Tandy 2000, that type of machine, to really um, handle the color effectively. Okay, Lee, thanks. Uh, with Mac now moving into the office arena and the business arena, some products have become very important. On the software side, one is Jazz. On the hardware side, as we've heard, the Apple LaserWriter. We have a report. When the developers of Lotus 123 announced that they were working on a similar package for the Macintosh, Apple saw it as a major step forward for the Mac. The idea of a multifunctional software package designed for the graphics environment of their new computer seemed like the ideal project. We've taken some of the ideas and some of the lessons we learned in developing 123 and Symphony, which exists for the IBM and other compatible computers, taken some of those lessons and redesigned a new concept for the Macintosh. Very important to note, though, that we didn't merely carry over the products 123 and Symphony in the Macintosh. We started from scratch. We started from the Macintosh using the unique design capabilities of that machine, especially the graphical user interface. Like 123 and Symphony, Jazz permits the user to keep several files active simultaneously. Database, memo sheet, word processing, and communications work interactively and make extensive use of the Mac's icons and hidden menus. Apple's determination to make its new machine a success led to some unusual partnerships during the Mac's development. If most new machines on the market try to fit themselves to existing software or hope for third-party companies to jump in, Apple courted the major software producers ahead of time. It was sometime around the months of July, if I recall correctly, that Apple first showed us the Macintosh, which they're subsequently going to announce and release in January of 1984. So we were able to see the Macintosh up front. And we made a decision to develop for it because it was so unique. It was so different from what we had seen from other manufacturers. Apple's attempt to anticipate the Mac's early needs did not end with software. The company is taking aim at IBM's office market with a new laser printer. Apple is betting that the laser's high speed, about eight pages a minute, combined with the Mac's lively graphics, will finally give the computer the image they want as a serious business tool from a determined company. Stuart, Jazz is being offered to us as a state-of-the-art product, and I think it would be interesting to see you know, how we got to this point and where we're going to go to in the future. Well, I think our next guest can help us do that. Larry Tesler has joined us now. Larry worked at Xerox Park. Larry helped develop the Lisa, and he's now the manager of the future architecture group for the Macintosh. Larry, you and others uh, at Xerox Park uh, in the early 70s had a vision about what we're going to see in the 80s, and you hit, looks to me, right on. Um, what were the steps that led us to this kind of a user interface that we're dealing with right now? Well, there was a lot that went into it. It really probably started back in the 60s with uh, Doug Engelbart's NLS group at SRI in, in Menlo Park, where they, they envisioned the uh, coming of office automation and developed a system where actually the first mouse was used. It was a mouse very much like this with three buttons. But they were way ahead of their time, 20 years ahead of their time. Anyway, at Xerox Park, a few people from that group came and joined us. And the main motivation at Park was an understanding that hardware costs were plummeting and systems with high resolution graphics which were then at would cost hundred thousand dollars for a reasonable uh, computer aided design system would be coming down in price to the point where someone could have it in their living room or in their office this was really incredible at the time we, we could barely believe the numbers but there they were the time the, was when Larry this was uh, 1970 is when park started I became an employee in 73 
visions of things like the Dynabook, for example, I guess. Oh, yeah. That uh, 